Without a visual aid. You did. Just hi, a single slide. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for waiting. It's, uh, I know you've probably got a busy day, so we'll, we'll attempt to, uh, to, to stay on target. Um, here with me is, uh, is Mike Gallagher. Mike, good to see you. It's great to be here, Clive. Um, really excited about this morning. I, I just thought the keynotes were just, it, it, just a breath of fresh air coming from Washington to get all of that in what was supposed to be two hours, but three was really exciting. Well, <laughs> it was only three hours. Oh, well, they, they announced no. halfway, but I thought he was kidding. Yeah. It's a, it's a breath of fresh air. Many things might be a breath of fresh air coming from Washington, though. Indeed. <laughs> these, uh, on these moments. Well, um, I'm not doing my email if people think I am. I've actually got the questions that we're going to ask Mike um, as, we, as we talk about the ESA's I'm not presence. Boring you. Yeah, no, you're not. Don't worry. Okay. Don't worry. So, Mike, Mike, why don't you start by just before, and we'll, we'll attempt to stick on schedule, and then we'll do some Q&A. So if you've got questions, we're going to get to that. But, um, Mike, why don't you... Tell people who maybe aren't familiar with the ESA what, the great work that you do. Well, first of all, how many in the room, raise your hand if you're familiar with the Entertainment Software Association or ESA. So it's only a few hands go up. All right, so the Entertainment Software Association is the trade association based in Washington that represents gamers and game makers. So whenever the industry wants to speak with one voice, they come through us. Now you have the IGDA, which is probably more familiar to everybody in this room. They represent the individual developer. Um, or small developing companies, probably more of you are familiar with the work they do. And what we do is we engage in all of the public policy issues that impact this industry that are very complex from tax, immigration, all of those things. Um, and then we also do a few other things to help elevate the industry and make sure that everyone's aware of what we, who we are, how the growth is happening, what an exciting medium this is, the magic that you make, and the principal manifestation of that is E3. Now, how many in the room have heard of E3? Okay, about a few more hands. That's good, making progress. And that's coming up here in June, right here in LA. Now you do um, a mountain of work in gaming to make game developers' lives easier and represent gaming at the very highest levels. What, um, what are you doing in VR and how much of that is net new yeah. versus what you've been doing already for, uh, for, for the gaming business? That's a, that's, a, that's a really good question because when we look at virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, by the way, I keep trying to couple with a consolidated term for this, which no one accepts. So it's like we have to keep listing all three until this sorts itself out. Um, but what, what we are is we're seeing this is a new manifestation of the uh, incredible evolution of a great industry. So if you look at the video game industry, it's constantly been in change, constantly been innovating, constantly doing one thing. And this is from my, I just, uh, May 7th will be 10 years I've been doing this job. And what it's been doing for 30 or 40 years is reinventing the interface between humans and machines. That's what it's been engaged in, in the most fundamental level, and not in a laboratory, not with a university, but doing it in the homes and in the pockets and in the hands of consumers. And doing it not just in the US, but now around the world through the power of companies like Unity. And, and those tools, so what's happened now is virtuality, augmented reality, mixed reality, they build on the areas where we need to be proactive. So like for example, ESA, the basic portfolio, we, we have E3, which is very important, it promotes the industry, it's the industry's megaphone. And we do that here in LA, it tells the whole world, here's what's coming next in games. We also have the uh, ratings board, so you, in, not just in this country, but around the world, you have to rate your games. And here in this country, it's optional, you don't have to. We strongly encourage everyone to do that. But you go into another country, you want your game to sell on Android or on, on Apple, it has to be rated, it's required. We have a worldwide system you know, that we have more and more governments signing up to, more and more platforms signing up, so that that's available free to the developer, that you go through, fill in something that's very short, boom, it goes out, and, and you've got a rating on your game. So those are two really important things. We also run the foundation. So the good deeds of the industry are focused through the ESA Foundation. Um, we uh, do a variety of things which we can talk more about to help amplify, again, the good works of the industry. We have content protection. When you make something, you need the government to protect your intellectual property. We work with the government, the governments around the world, to see that that happens so that we can minimize the extent to which you get ripped off when others uh, clone or steal your work. And so those are the basic portfolio, but the one we're most known for besides E3 and the rating board is the lobbying. So we go into Washington and we talk to the Congress, to the courts, and the Supreme Court case is one example of that. 
um, and then also to uh, uh, agencies and say, here's where this industry should go. So for virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, you have a lot of curiosity now from policymakers. What does this mean? Where's it going? Should I be excited or afraid? And if we get in early, then we can help set that table properly so they're excited to receive everything that comes next. And those that are critics of the industry or critics of the technology, we keep them in the shadows. Right. Now, it's a good segue, I think, to something I wanted to ask you about, which was uh, the VR caucus. Yes. Is that right? So the ESA are announcing a VR caucus. Is it this week? It's it literally tomorrow. It's tomorrow. So, so what, this what, is the first you're going to hear about it in this room right now. Is so this is announcement's coming tomorrow. What, what's, what is a caucus it's and how does it relate to VR and what's the value? So this is Washington speak for a group of very influential people that are uniting to say, we're supporting you. That's what a caucus is. And the caucus is made up of members of the House of Representatives and the US government. So you know Congress, you have the Senate and the House. On the House side, this is a bipartisan group, Republicans and Democrats, who are gonna uh, launch a caucus tomorrow that's going to say, we're here to be supportive of virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, all of them. That's a very long name for a caucus. Um, and uh, what this builds on is the success. And again, it's Congress that's launching it. We're the industry partners supporting it. It's their decision to do it. But we're right here to provide the resources. And we launched with, or Congress launched uh, four years ago, the Ener Competitiveness and Entertainment Technology Caucus, otherwise known as the Video Game Caucus. All right, now this started with about 40 members. It's up to 110 right now. All right, and these are, these are members bipartisan, who say, we're all about video games, we love what you're doing. The challenge around this is we didn't have one of these 20 years ago. So our industry spent a lot of time fending off people that were critical of us, that said what you're doing is harmful to kids, or it's a waste of time, or it's an economic wasteland. And now we have a caucus of 110 strong. Just to give you an idea of what that means, there's 435 members in the House. And they have all the caucuses are listed. This caucus is the 17th biggest caucus in Congress. Now, most of you would say, if number 17, like the Ricky Bobby rule, you're not doing very well. <laughs> but it's the biggest caucus that is not a country or a disease. So there's the diabetes caucus, the cancer caucus, uh, the Italian caucus, the Jewish caucus, and then you get down, the very first one after those is video games. It's bigger than movies, bigger than the internet, all those other caucuses out there, it's what we do, it's what we make, which you make, sorry, we're just pleased to represent you. Um, and so it's really, really exciting that the Congress is now saying, we wanna make sure we're receiving AR, MR, and VR in a, in a, in a positive way, and ESA is gonna help us do that. All right, so what, what do you, what, if you fast forward maybe a year to two years, um, what, what would you think the, the success of a caucus would look like? This, I love this question, Clive, as I ask it all the time to right. my team. What is success? Yeah, what does like? it look like? I mean, Why are we doing this? Yeah. All right, so here's, the, here's, uh, here's two scenarios, and the caucus ideally is well positioned to do both. One of them is we break out of the, um, let's see, what's John's expression for the uh, gap? The gap of disappointment. The gap of disappointment. We start seeing an upsurge in fascination with the technology, fascination with what it can do, not only for entertainment, which is us, but for education, for tourism, for government, for healthcare, for all of these other applications that you're here representing, the magic that you're making, that this takes off and you've got a bunch of members of Congress are saying, how do we grow this all across the country? What tax benefits do you need to attract the talent you need? How do you attract the workers that you need to do this? Because my guess is, it looks pretty complicated. You need some pretty high powered people to do it. What type of trade agreements do we need to have in place so you make it once and sell it everywhere? Um, and on and on and on. And they're saying, how do we help you? That's the positive scenario. And they're right there with the industry, applauding as we go and excited to provide the lift. Now, if we're doing our job right, you guys do your job right, we create those tailwinds, this group is gonna be there to capture it and move the ball when it comes to policy in Washington. Right. Here's the other scenario. Something wrong goes wrong. Somebody does something bad after they were doing VR in their home for 30 minutes, three days, it doesn't matter. They do something wrong. We've seen this movie before or this video game before. Is the critics come and say it was the technology that made them do it, all right? And it says it was, this, or the particular application game or whatever it might be, 
and then there needs to be an investigation, mm -hmm. and then a regulation, and all these other things that need to happen because we need to control the menace, right? That's what this industry, the video game industry, had to defeat that. It took us a better part of 20 years. Are you, are you starting to see any of the beginnings of those VR cases? Or? Uh, so here's, uh, there's two places where that's coming from. So the, just to answer your question fully, the second purpose is to have that group of members in Congress ready to say, no, 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 I know better. That's not the whole truth. We're going to be fair to this technology and this industry and, and learn about this before we rush to judgment. And if there is an impact, then we'll have to talk about it. But of course, we don't believe there is. There's no evidence that there is. That doesn't stop our critics, by the way. That doesn't slow them down for a second. You think fake news has been around, it's been around our industry forever. Okay, so, so that, that's the, the ideal scenario uh, if, about a defensive okay. role of this group. Now, what was, your, what was the follow-on to that? Well, I was wondering if there were any starting rip, the ripples mm. of VR cases and uh, you know, Washington starting to become so, anxious about VR. Interesting. Um, we had a question came to us last fall. The U.S. Senate wanted to have a hearing on augmented reality only. Not, not virtual, just augmented. And I wondered really how they knew the difference. But they were very focused on this. And, uh, and so we went in and participated along with uh, the CEO of Niantic, uh, John, um, I blank on his last name, but um, he, he, he testified along with another group. But you could see that this hearing could have gone the wrong way, and it was really focused on Pokemon Go. And we've had four different states now, including Illinois and New York, Massachusetts, where, they in, where bills are introduced to control or regulate Pokemon Go. Mm. Now, the grounds of concern from the state governments are legitimate. There are people that do not want flocks of strangers moving through their property chasing digital creatures, and that's a fair concern on their part. Now, how we address it, let's be smart about it. And let's not have one bad example uh, set the precedent for how everything's gonna get done in virtual, augmented, and mixed reality. So we have to go in and we're, you know, a combination, depends on how it goes. We're rarely the Navy, we're most often the Air, most often the Air Force and the Army. We go in there and make sure we educate and put that, um, create an understanding. But we're seeing it in Pokemon Go, we're seeing the interest on Capitol Hill. But you see, the market penetration right now is at what, about five million units uh, worldwide? Well, it's two, two, two million serviceable units of VR right now. Two million. VR hardware. And, and yep. then is that worldwide or US? That's uh, from a domestic perspective, that's okay. worldwide. So, so you got a couple million. Well, it's a big country and that's not really enough yet and probably the content isn't robust enough to create the controversies that could come. But I think everyone in this room, it wouldn't be too far of a reach to come up with something that would be provocative, something that would, that would be misunderstood, where then the critics, and this is the second part of it, we want a Supreme Court case on behalf of video games that says you can't regulate them, they're entitled to the same First Amendment rights as motion pictures, books, and music. And you'd think that, of course, that would be true. Everyone in this room would believe it. But it turns out that there were critics, and they got Governor Schwarzenegger and Leland Yee, who's, that's bipartisan, to pass a law and then prosecute that law all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court to seek to take down the video game industry, and we beat them. Right? That was a big win. In the context of that came up this, the, all of the enemies came out. And they were, they could smell blood in the water, and they thought it was ours. They were wrong, it was theirs. Um, and they were coming after us. Those same groups are exactly the ones where you would see the criticism come in if there was an incident. Got it. So you and, and, we're, and we're starting to see again, you, you can see people saying, was this good for, what happens if kids do it? Yeah. What's the industry doing to talk about that? Is there a rating system? What are they doing when they have that thing on? I can't see it. Like the mom and dad, that's one of the things about the technology is you can't look over their shoulder. So. All of the, you can start hearing the rumblings, and the quicker we're in front of that ignorance, the better we address it as um, market leaders, as responsible citizens, the better off this industry will be. Well, what can, what can the industry do to, um, you know, because re regulation of a creative uh, medium and industry is uh, not a good thing, right? And the ESA has fought for regulation to be as sensible and as principled as possible for creativity in video gaming. And um, hearing you talk about it, kind of an exposing some of the, the battles that you have to go through uh, makes me feel good that you guys are around. I mean, I've been in the gaming business for 25 years, and thank you for kind of taking the scars for some of us. Um, but what can the VR and AR industry do and people in this room do 
to help you so this become is, more effective. And first of all, make great stuff, right? Make the magic happen. Um, uh, I get the question frequently when I'm speaking with other groups, isn't this just like 3D? You know, of course not, it's not, okay? But then you have to explain to them why it's not like that. Make the magic happen, right? Because that's gonna continue to drive positive attention into the space, whether it's investment, whether it's support from regulators or your mayor or whoever it is where the companies are opening and growing. So, so that's one, just, just do a great job of what you're doing. Two is when you're, when you're making your game or your application, if it touches kids in any way, if it's intended to have kids as an audience, be aware there are special rules that apply to that and be smart about finding them. I'm happy, we have resources we can make available so you can be very smart about what you do if you're gonna engage with children. Um, and, and the third thing I would say is rate your products because if you, and the IARC rating system, so it's under the SRB as the International Age Rating Council. This is the ratings authorities for Europe and the US and Brazil and Australia and soon to be two or three others. It's a one-stop shop. You plug in and answer the questions, it spits out ratings in all those environments. You'll be ahead of the pack. And the more of you that rate your content, the better we can say the industry is when it comes to the criticism. The final thing I would add is, be part of our video game voters network. It's free, we don't sell your information, we don't put spam or any marketing on it, but what it is, it's a, it's a group, it's right up here, it's at the top of this slide, is 1.7 million, that's 1.3 right there, but it's up to 1.7. 1.7 million strong that when there's somebody that has a bad idea, we let you know. And then we give you an easy pathway, delivered right through this website, areweinyourstate.com. It gives you an easy pathway to say, I'm in the industry, don't do this. I live in your district, don't do this. Here's a, and by the way, if they do something right, give them that round of applause that they deserve. And we'll point that in your direction. So be engaged through this, um, through this tool. And this tool right here is really fun. This is the most recent thing we announced in February. This is our understanding of who you are. There's 3,193 companies that we found, and we had this incredible intern. She found them all individually. She verified each one. I audited her to say, okay, is that really true? Every single one of these in every state she went and found. Then we mapped them by congressional district. You overlay it with the universities that are teaching video game curriculum, offering degrees. Powerful tool. But this is who we see you. Now, if there's something we can do to make this better, let us know. This is version 2.0. We'll keep improving. We're like Google, always in beta. <laughs> um, you, uh, you're a U.S. Um, focused organization. Um, what's happening around the world that you're aware of and who, how, do you, how do you play with um, other, other organizations internationally to make sure, because we're, we're in a global market, yes. right? So there's people in this room who are gonna be creating globally. And the ESA helps us in North America, but how, do we, uh, how can they go through you to make sure that internationally they're aware? Yeah, this is a challenge for our industry because it shows the, it's the benefit of incumbency that motion pictures have and music have, is that they've been around for 100 years, so they have better representation around the world. Right now, we have organizations like ESA in Europe, Germany, Australia, very, very strong, uh, Japan, very strong, but there are other parts of the world that are more limited, like all of South America, virtually all of Africa. There's no or organization like ours. And also, ESA is the only one that has a CEO board. So it's the head of PlayStation, Xbox, EA, um, et cetera, that are on the board. And what they do is they, they're able to activate around the world. Um, so our remit is nominally here, where we're asked to go solve issues often takes us well outside the borders. And, um, and it's, but, but Peggy, USK, and they are hearing they have a lot of curiosity about what's happening. And in those environments, the government comes first. Here in this country, you come first. That's a very different model. But in other parts of the world, regulators have the first say about whether a device is allowed in the market, what it's allowed to do, what the products are that'll be licensed for it. You don't just get to load it in an app store and distribute it. So those parts of the world, you, you, we're starting to hear more about it, but you've, how many have heard about the Korean gamer that played games continuously and then died, right? Okay, everybody, more than heard of E3 or ESA. <laughs> that story travels like wildfire, and all it's gonna take is somebody to go into that virtual world, into the holodeck, and not come back for a while, and that type of thing, and that country will inflame others. Got it. Um, 
I'm just looking at the clock. I'd really love to get some questions from the audience if there are any. Um, there's microphones down here. Please, so everyone can hear you, please come down and, uh, and talk into the microphone. And if you could just from, uh, say your name and who you're with, that'd be great. Uh, sure, hi, uh, Theo Sky with the advisory. Hi, Clive. Um, uh, just had a question about the rating system. Um, what, uh, what sort of, what's involved from a content creator standpoint in terms of um, a timeline and maybe any fees or costs or anything like that involved? So uh, it's a fill in the bubble quiz. <laughs> basically for your, for your content. And it rates all apps, by the way. So, right, right now it's adopted by uh, Android uses it. Right now, if you're making an app on Android, you, you're required to do it by, by Google. Okay, so it's, it's mostly sort of, it's, it's opt-in first of all, and then it's self-rating essentially. Um, so there's, there's no sort of reviews by external parties or anything like that? The reviews come in interestingly. This is, it's, it's our attempt to mirror the world and the technology that you're in is the community is the one that would raise the impurity. Yep. And then Android or Google's authorized, Google Play is authorized to act. And then if that same publisher or developer uh, continues to have problems, then they can delist them entirely. Got it, so it's enforced by the marketplace. Exactly. Cool, all right. So it's meant to be very much like the popularity of your own product, it, that, that it would be um, enforced in the same manner. Okay. And what's fascinating about the ratings, in the US we care about sex. In Europe, they don't care about sex, they care a lot about violence. The US doesn't care about violence. <laughs> And then in Asia, they care a lot about gambling. They're very, very concerned about that. Uh, the other parts of it more negotiable. So, and this algorithm takes all that into account for all of the local nomenclature. It's all run by uh, uh, this International Age Rating uh, Council. Cool. All right, thank you. You bet. Hi, my name is Shem. Um, I am from ReachGate, a small VR studio. Um, my, I, I know that you guys talked a lot about kind of the entertainment um, industry. Uh, so our company is trying to look more into enterprise. And I guess because instead of being an entertainment association, this is more of like a VR in general caucus. How does that relate to enterprise software? Uh, to enterprise software? Yes. In VR. Yes. So um, where I, I, I would say that this is the caucus that's going to be launched tomorrow by Congress that we're supporting is very much focused on enterprise. It's meant to capture all the things about real estate research, all the other things I've listed, all, the, everything we saw on the keynote this morning that isn't a game. It's meant to capture that. Okay. And, uh, and, and that, that, that's the reservoir for it. And what we're doing is, look, if this technology fails to get lift off, we can't, if it's just because it's a real estate app that gets to be criticized, we're gonna go in and defend it because we need to defend the game part of it, the interactive entertainment part, and then as the real estate industry dawns on them, oh, right. we have VR, we should probably protect this. So the fact that, that's then a we'll great question out. actually, and it was one I was gonna ask you after, so just to hit on that a bit more, you know, we know that VR and AR is going to be um, probably one of the most pervasive things that has hit the planet and civilization over the next 10 to 20 years, I certainly believe that, and I think you're in this room because you believe it too. When it starts to make, um, really high impact in education and in medical mm -hmm. and in community and in social mm -hmm. and, and in industry and in design, you know, it, it, it really will n not just be an entertainment mechanism, Correct. although entertainment is gonna be spectacular on it. Mm -hmm. So in this caucus, it sounds like what you're doing is you're saying, look, we're closest to this notion of 3D because we've come from gaming. Um, let us be involved in this caucus to uh, provide its legitimacy, along with all of the Congress people, and then um, let other industries catch up. It's open source for them to come right. in. And then, yes, so you have it exactly right, that's the model. We're the first landing point, we're first encounter mm. in the consumers. Right now it's being done through interactive entertainment, through video games which we're incredibly proud of, because again, it goes back to that redefining the interface. Yeah. And so we're really, because we think it's gonna continue, and we're very happy. So we'll use our expertise of 20 years of doing this on behalf of video games, extend it to the technology as it goes into the other areas you described. Those sectors will come in, and they will have a welcome position in this caucus on the enterprise side, and be able to take those um, um, positions forward. Great, so you can coach uh, other industries yeah, in, a, in, a, in a sense. And attract them in. Yeah, that's Many good. times it's educate them. Yeah, great, thank you. Thanks. Um, we can do one more question even though we're out of time. If there is one more, that's great. If not, 
we can wrap. One more. It's <laughs> great. Hello, my name's Michael. I'm with Boeing. I was curious about what honestly causes someone in the government to join that caucus board. Mm -hmm. Is it just because they like video games themselves or do they have other motives? That's a great question. Is uh, So uh, it's what does success look like for the caucus from the caucus members' perspective? Um, and really, the fundamental driver there, there are probably two or three. One is constituency. If Boeing is using augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, um, and that con Congress member from Washington State knows it, then like Suzanne Dalbene, uh, Congresswoman Dalbene, uh, represents the first congressional district in Washington, she'll be one of the founding co-chairs, just to give you an idea. There are two others from California, one from Texas. Um, again, bipartisan. The constituent interest is first. Those are the ones that are gonna come automatically. It's when you have a company like Unity in your district, they're coming in and they're saying this is really important. That Congress member is gonna go, okay, I'm on board and I'm gonna join that thing. The second will be somebody who has jurisdiction. So Congress divides up the world into these things like banking, finance, technology, agriculture, all those things. Well, if this falls into the tech area, those tech members are the next target because they have jurisdiction. Even if they're in Iowa and nobody's heard of virtual reality yet, then they'll still be engaged because they sit on the committee that oversees this. Um, and then um, I would say over time, it'll be something personal. Like we have people join, uh, or we Congress members join because their kids are working in the industry. Great. Because their kids are supporting. I mean, it's such a transformational time we've come where now they're excited about the jobs. That's what they talk about much more than anything else is the jobs. The average wage in the industry is $97,000 a year. And I think in the VR space for now, it's gonna go higher because it's so technical. And before we uh, conclude, Clive, I just wanted to thank Unity for having me. It's a delight to visit with you. We could not be prouder of the numbers that you guys put up when it comes to engagement. 2.4 billion, I think it was at the last mm -hmm. count, number of devices, unique mm -hmm. devices, nearly 6 billion downloads of Unity uh, programs. So Unity does a program. 16 billion. 16 million. But, but it's billion. billion. Yeah, it's got a billion. B on it, 16 oh. billion. But it's nothing without the great people in this room. And yeah. we only supply the tool, it's the creators who make the wonderful product. So we applaud you as all the creators. Well, let's put it back to you. We, we applaud you. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you for the work that you've done and the scars that the ESA has <laughs> protecting creators. Thanks in advance as well for the work that you we'll can do ahead. with us for VR and AR. Thanks for coming today and talking it through. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right.